Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, we'll talk about the lieutenant governor's controversial remarks about LGBTQ in schools and what's made available in schools on the subject and the mental well-being of our young people following the three deaths by suicide at UNC Chapel Hill. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. Just three days before National Coming Out Day, video surfaced of North Carolina's Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson at a church in Seagrove delivering a speech that has offended members of the LGBTQ community and general public. Here's a clip. I'm saying this now, and I've been saying it, and I don't care who likes it. Those issues have no place in a school. <laughs> There's no reason anybody anywhere in America should be telling any child about transgenderism, homosexuality, any of that filth. And yes, I called it filth. And if you don't like it that I called it filth, come see me and I'll explain it to you. In the weeks since this video appeared, Lieutenant Governor Robinson has appeared on local news and presented his own press conference to reiterate what he said, stand by it, and attempt to clarify that he was objecting to the presentation of LGBTQ issues in schools. He named three books in particular that are available in the libraries of a few schools that contain pictures and subject matter that he described as sexual and near pornographic. Governor Cooper has called the words and actions of the lieutenant governor abhorrent, and some Democratic lawmakers have called for his resignation. No Republican lawmakers have issued any criticism. House Speaker Tim Moore has said in a statement to the NNO that the lieutenant governor has clarified a statement and has said plainly that he was describing this reading material, not any person or community. So, to discuss this controversy, I'd like to welcome Tamika Walker-Kelly, president of the North Carolina Association of Educators. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Ms. Walker-Kelly. Now, the lieutenant governor has certainly said that, well, he said that the idea, quote, that our children should be taught about concepts of transgenderism and be exposed to sexually explicit materials in the classroom is abhorrent. And getting down to that subject, what can you share about the three books in question that he referenced in his press release and their availability in the schools? Well, first, thank you for having me on the show today. Um, now, I cannot speak specifically to those three books, but I can speak to this. Our teachers, which include our school librarians, have the professional knowledge and expertise when it comes to selecting instructional material that reflect the unique and diverse needs of our student population. And therefore, our school libraries are varied across the state. And that work is not done in silos. It is done in collaboration and in partnership with our parents so that students have access to a wealth of material that reflects what they need in the classroom. Well, let me ask you this. That material, if anybody sees it, would, would uh, cause them to think, it caused me to think, why is that in the library at school? Now, if someone does have an objection, a teacher, a parent, whatever, what kind of um, access or avenues do they have to get that material removed? So the lieutenant governor should know that there are processes on the local and state level that allow for the review of instructional materials when they come to school. That is part of the professional work that our school librarians do every day. And it is important to know that our school librarians do the work of reviewing and weeding material on a yearly basis because the needs of our students' population, they change on a yearly basis. And again, that work is not done just just on in our school level, it is done in collaboration with our parents to make sure that our students have access uh, to engaging and uh, instructional material. Well, I know that you're in communication with educators. What are you hearing back from educators in the classroom about the impact of these statements and how they can potentially impact the teacher, the classroom, and the students? 
So the diversity of our state, our students in our classroom, they represent the best of us. And the harmful words of our Lieutenant Governor do not reflect what North Carolina is and what North Carolina can be. My work as an educator, and my fellow educators can attest to this, is that we work really hard to create safe, affirming, and welcoming classrooms for all of our students. And these words that were shared by our Lieutenant Governor run counter to the work that we do every day and the work that all of our elected officials should be doing across the state. I can't imagine um, what the impact of having him as the head of the Board of Education is. Has that made a difference in how you all are operating in, uh, uh, in terms of this particular issue? Well, my duty as an educator, our duty as teachers across the state is to advocate that every single student all of them have access to high quality public education. And since the Lieutenant Governor sits on the State Board of Education, he should also be advocating that every single student also have access to that education as well. And unfortunately, he has used his platform to put students and educators in the middle of a political war that undercuts the work that we are trying to do as educators across the state. One of the things that he has pointed to is reading scores and uh, performance levels. So what work, I would think that more focus needs to be on getting kids to read and do math and perform in schools um, and maybe secondary, you know, concerns about these political matters. But I also wanted to ask about protest um, against what he has said um, and if, the, if there is any kind of rallying support against it, or, you know, is it something that's uh, really not being taken heavily by educators? So our educators are doing the work in their classroom because that is where the direct impact for students lie. And so our educators continue uh, to do their professional development, to do their work in their communities, to let students know that the classroom is a safe place for them to be, no matter their zip code, no matter where they're from, and no matter how they identify. It is our constant work that students see themselves reflected in the work that we do in their instructional materials and in their community at large. And so we stand in support with our fellow colleagues to make sure that our classrooms, our schools, and our state continue to be welcoming places for every single person. The lieutenant governor's remarks have not only raised questions about what our children learn in schools about LGBTQ culture and community, but also about the broader implications and impact of the words we've been hearing, filth and garbage, on the young people who populate and walk the halls of our schools. I want to welcome and bring into the conversation Reverend Jamon Taylor, rector at St. Ambrose Episcopal Church in Raleigh, Dr. Stephanie Irby Cord, a psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Human Human Development and Family Studies at UNC Greensboro, and also Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Wake County Chapter of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Dr. Cord, I want to open with you. Now, the governor, the lieutenant governor, has been sure to make clear that he does not hate the LGBTQ community, that he'll fight for their right to express themselves however they want, but that the teaching about this community is inappropriate in the schools. What are your thoughts about that? Sure. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you, Deborah, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, like many, I am offended by the lieutenant governor's uh, comments. Anytime you suggest uh, that someone's lived experience, um, that their uh, lifestyle is filthy, it's offensive, it's hurtful, and it's shameful. Um, I'm very concerned about the youth, and I'm concerned because the youth need to be able to see themselves and to be able to um, uh, feel as if they, um, that their experiences are valid and that their experiences are something that are respected. I am not familiar with all the books that the lieutenant governor was upset about, upset with, but I do know that one of the books is a personal memoir, and I know it well. And how do you go about uh, disrespecting someone's lived experience? Um, and that memoir was written because it was something that 
the authors thought would be helpful for others to be able to identify with and perhaps be able to speak their own truth. And so I'm really concerned about those youth that feel that they're outside of the boundaries and that they're not able to speak their truth and be their authentic self. And I think school is an important uh, system and an important space and place for that to take place. Let me stick with you on authentic self for a moment. Are you able in elementary school to know what your authentic self is? Some adults haven't figured it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a process, not that you know, cognitively, children are uh, at a stage of really understanding in any real depth who they are, but it's a process. And I think that any child should be able to see themselves or see possible selves uh, shown and, 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 and made to feel respected and, and, and provided. And I would think not just themselves, but people who are their friends or, and or family. So, uh, Reverend Taylor, as vocal as some have been over the past week or so, it's important also, I think, to hear the silence as well. Black churches have been particularly silent in some respects about LGBTQ community. We, uh, we sort of know that. Um, what do you make of the idea that the lieutenant governor made at a church uh, where he received thunderous applause during his speech? It's tragic and unchristian. I want to say without equivocation that what the lieutenant governor said um, was, was horrific. Um, you simply do not demean people. Uh, certainly the lieutenant governor uh, calls himself a Christian. And I think it's important to look at Jesus Christ because uh, during his day, the religious authorities, the elected officials accused him of hanging out with filthy people. Uh, he hung out with lepers who were ceremonially unclean and segregated. Uh, he hung out with uh, sex workers, prostitutes. He hung out with tax collectors. When we hear tax collectors in our day and age, we think IRS, but a tax collector in Jesus's day was more like a murderous uh, drug dealer, like Nino Brown from New Jack City or Avon Barksdale from The Wire or El Chapo. These were the people he hung out with, uh, so-called filthy people. And yet, the religious leaders went after him for that, and Jesus loved him. Um, and Jesus did not call them names. Rather, the ones he called names were the religious authorities, the elected officials, uh, hypocrites, brood of vipers. And so when you hear the lieutenant governor um, speak uh, two faces, I would say double tongue, to say that he supports the rights of LGBTQ uh, community, but then calls them filthy, that makes no sense. Um, he's contradicting himself. And I think uh, this is uh, the last well, one statement, the current statement, in a long line of offensive statements that uh, the lieutenant governor has made. When we talk about the church and the silence, yes, the silence is deadening. Uh, the black church has been carrier of culture and community. And when it comes to uh, the queer and trans community, the church has been silent. Um, and God will judge us for that. Uh, God is not pleased with that, is, is my view, because we serve a God who reached out to those who are oppressed um, and those who are downtrodden. Um, also, uh, I think we look at not only what the, the lieutenant governor said, but also in music. Uh, certainly, the lieutenant governor made a statement and there were thunderous applause. We have to remind people that uh, gospel singer Ty Tribbett and his uh, song at the end uh, says, God's calling you out of homosexuality. God's calling you out, calling you out of lesbianism as people are applauding. Um, and so we really, the black church really has to look at how we are contributing to the oppressive environment in which our brothers and sisters and those uh, who do not uh, correspond to binary gender have been put under, um, and we are supposed to stand with them, and yet the church, I believe, is putting a knee on their neck, um, and they can't breathe. Well, thank you for that reflection and that insight, too. Tamika, let me, let me uh, get to you about just how the NCAE and the education environment deals with um, the LGBTQ culture and where the support is for that culture and that, and that community. 
Yes, so just like we work really hard to create safe and affirming environments for all of our students, no matter how they identify, we do the same work for our educators, for our adults, to make sure that they have safe and affirming work cultures as well. And so we provide as an organization in our national organization, the National Education Association, we provide a lot of resources for our educators uh, to make sure that they have the skills in order to better serve our students, our LGBTQ students, and also to work with their LGBTQ colleagues. So they're getting some sort of training, cultural sensitivity training? So we have uh, resources like with the uh, Gay Straight Alliance um, because many of our uh, middle schools and high schools uh, have clubs um, where students uh, can come and be affirmed. Um, we have also uh, reading uh, resources that educators can use and we have professional development courses as well. Well, Dr. Cord, Reverend Taylor, I want to talk about the fear. What are people, you think, afraid of on both sides of the issue when it comes to homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism? Uh, Dr. Cord. Sure. I think similar to racism, I think that uh, we are afraid of having very courageous conversations. These are difficult discussions to have. And I think that parents are really struggling with how to have these discussions. I think they're struggling with how to um, accept that uh, they don't have control over all the ways in which their child identifies or behaves, um, and that they, you know, um, really just struggle with um, not being able to have that control. That um, control is key. That, that's very a huge key. one. Uh, and go ahead. And, uh, and it's also important for me to just say that, you know, children are aware of race and gender types of orientations and feelings far earlier than we give them credit for. Um, and so I think we need to acknowledge that and we need to listen to children. If they feel different, if they feel somehow unaccepted, if they feel that, um, that somehow uh, they are falling out the box or out of the lines of what may be traditionally acceptable. We need to listen to those feelings. Reverend Taylor, what are your thoughts about the fear and, and what we can do to overcome it? People tend to fear that which they do not understand or do not know. Um, and many uh, deny the fact that they know or have any relationship with uh, the, tr the queer and trans community. Uh, what we do at St. Ambrose, because we uh, welcome all, is that we highlight um, May, which is Minority Health Mental, uh, Mi National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. And in June, we highlight Pride Month. And particularly what we do in Pride Month is uh, we pray um, for the queer and trans community. And we even lift up the names of those uh, trans people who have been murdered and attacked. And we do a litany in church every Sunday. We offer these prayers to God. We offer uh, our prayers so that we may walk alongside God and work along justice and liberation for all people, uh, because we believe that black life matters. And if black life matters, then that means black trans life matters, black queer life matters. And so. Uh, the, the way we are tackling fear, at least in our religious context, is first praying, which is offering that to God, um, and then partnering with organizations so that we can help uh, deconstruct these systems of oppression. I think what you've said is so key, uh, Dr. Cord, the control and uh, Reverend Taylor, just the education and information and knowledge. And uh, let's hope that the information flow continues and the conversations continue as well. In many ways, we've been talking about tolerance and what it takes to create a social environment where everyone feels safe and can enjoy the freedom of life. But also, this past week, a university and community are mourning as three UNC Chapel Hill students took their own lives. In North Carolina, suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth in North Carolina, 10 to 18. Nationwide, suicide death rates for black American girls ages 13 to 19 increased by 182 percent from 2001 to 2017, and the rate of suicide deaths among young black males increased by 60 percent from 2001 through 2017. 
Uh, Reverend Taylor, it almost goes without saying we've all been sustaining a lot in the last year and a half with the onset of the pandemic and a lot of people, especially students, um, haven't had the outlet of church. What is important for us all to remember um, as family members and as friends uh, to protect the well-being, uh, the mental well-being of young people at this time? Certainly my heart goes out to those families of the students uh, at UNC. I remember when I was uh, an RA in a residence hall and one of my residents uh, attempted suicide and sitting with that person trying to get her help. I also remember when I was a chaplain at a black elementary school in Dallas, Texas, sitting across from a fifth grader who had marks on her wrist where she had tried to take scissors and kill herself. So we know that that suicide is real. Um, I know that the church for, for years has taught that suicide was an unforgivable unfor sin. Not such. Uh, the church, uh, Universalist, changed its teaching on that. I think the black church plays a, a particular important role in the community. Um, and as a, historically as it comes been related to mental health, the black church has not always been affirming of mental health. We would encourage people to just get over it or pray it out of you instead of seeking medical help and counseling. I remind people that if someone has a heart attack, they don't say pray your heart attack out of you. They say go to the ER. Uh, and the same needs to be true for mental health. We need to encourage therapy at St. Ambrose. We certainly do that. As I mentioned earlier, we highlight National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. I'm a proponent of therapy. I have a fund at the church if someone wants to get therapy and cannot afford it, the church will pay for it. And so certainly with the, the pandemic, um, people have not had outlets. And so we have to listen to our young people, listen to people. There are signs there um, and encourage them to get help and to destigmatize um, mental awareness, uh, mental health and mental illness. Ms. Walker Kelly, in the K 12 system, what kind of uh, mental well being support is there for kids um, and also for educators uh, in the school system? Yes, so as a, a teacher who has lost a former student to suicide, it is something that is deep, that I'm deeply passionate about. And so every K-12 school has access to at least one school counselor. And during the pandemic, we know that our school systems tried to increase resources that were available to students and families. Um, however, it is simply not enough. And we have heard over almost the past two years of this pandemic how we need increased mental health supports for our students. And so, you know, right now we are in the middle of our final budget negotiations. And so we are looking for our state leaders to increase funding and allocation for school counselors, school nurses, school psychologists, so our students and families have places and resources that they can go in order to make sure that our students, not only their physical well-being is important, but that their mental well-being is as well. And our educators have, ad have had access to some of those resources and on a limited basis, but our educators are struggling right now. Our teachers are not okay, burnout is real, fatigue is real, because we have increased the demands and work responsibilities of our teachers and our educators across the state with little to no help or recourse. And we hope that our state budget, our, our state leaders uh, will be able to deliver that um, with this final document. Well, you mentioned burnout, and I recall that over at UNC Chapel Hill, the student uh, body uh, president has, has emphasized the need for um, a well-being day. Dr. Korg, you know, life is difficult, and there are challenges. It's going to be tough. So how do we battle or understand or, or put into context, you know, a difficulty in life versus, you know, time to go get some help for your mental well-being? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'd like to say I think that Chapel Hill taking that day off as a mental health sort of wellness check day um, was completely appropriate. And I think we need to think about instituting those um, across, you know, other universities as well. I mean, I know we've done that at UNCG as well. Um, you know, faculty, students, we are all struggling. Um, and I think that it really requires um, us to uh, be flexible, to accommodate, um, 
and to allow for uh, students to give voice to their experiences. But, um, but understanding once again that, you know, college is tough. So how do you distinguish between, you know, time to just kind of buckle down and do what you need to do, whether it's the workplace or in school, and time to go get professional help? How do you even, as a friend, help somebody to see that? Yeah, I think given the context of what we've been living in, in terms of COVID and, and the pandemic, I think that we need to be particularly cautious and proactive. And so, uh, for example, when students come to me and talk about uh, some of the feelings that they're having of being down, I take it, you know, much more seriously because of the context that we're living in. And so I'm very proactive about referring them out or gaining some supports for them. Um, I don't question it because I feel like we can't um, at this point. Um, our students are really are really struggling. Uh, office hours these days are not about the content of the course. It's about their feelings. It's about what's going on with their families. Um, and they're asking for these supports. And so universities and schools are having to really rev up those supports in order to allow for that type of access to and that mental is health real. treatment. I, I so wish we had more time to talk about that, but that's all we have for today. Dr. Stephanie Irby Cord, Reverend Jamon Taylor, Tamika Walker Kelly, thank you so much for your time and your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank today's guests. We invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt Noel. Thanks for watching. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.